Hello and welcome to another edition of Time to Remember. I'm David Cullister. With me today is someone who came to the island in 1963 as a student at the Port Erin Marine Laboratory. Twenty years later, he returned as the director of the establishment, a post that he still holds, though his retirement is imminent. And he is, of course, Professor Trevor Norton. Since 1919, Liverpool University has had responsibility for the Port Erin Marine Laboratory. That arrangement comes to an end in 2006, when the property will be returned to the Manx government. But it was back in 1892 that William Herdman chose Port Erin as his base for marine research. Herdman became a professor of natural history in what was then Liverpool College, um, which was the College of Manchester University. And he was only 20, incredibly young. And he was there for 40 uh, odd years and incredibly productive and set up during that period three, four different marine laboratories, of which the only remaining one is this one. Mm. First of all, did some work off the coast of North Wales in Puffin Island and spent about five years there. And it was not really to do with the university at all. It was a sort of private gentleman's club. And the idea was, was that you paid five guineas a year and for that you got a table at the laboratory to work in the summer and do some natural history and you got a pint of alcohol a week, presumably for pickling the specimens. <laughs> and and uh, they kind of exhaust all the potential of Puffin Island, they thought. And Herdman had been dredging here on the Isle of Man from a boat, and he, they were astonished by the richness of the stuff that came up and quite a few of the species. They didn't know what they were. They were new to science. So he decided that what he'd do is move to the Isle of Man and set up a marine lab here. Not in this particular building, then? No, no, no. They built a very small marine lab and a little aquarium below what was then the Royal Hotel. And in fact, I think it was built by the man who was the, the owner of the Royal Hotel, and then they, they rented it from him. Mm. And you can still see a sort of concrete platform with steps going up. And there was a little lab on one side and a little aquarium on the other. Trouble was, it was very, very small and very cramped. It was nowhere near big enough and far too close to high tides that when the tide was high, all the marine creatures would retreat into the lab and you couldn't open a book without something jumping out at you. Yeah, of course, we had a fishing industry then. We also had a government, <coughs> but we didn't have anything like a department of fisheries, uh, presumably. So Herdman must have had some persuasive powers to get this building built here. Well, there weren't really departments of fisheries anywhere mm -hmm. in the British Isles. Um, it was mostly done by individuals who were interested. And Herdman became interested in, when he was in Liverpool because the British government had done away with all the legislation. And that meant there was a kind of a free-for-all. And the logic was that the sea was inexhaustible and there was no way you were going to the fish were going to decline. But they were wrong, of course. It was a time when new, new boats were coming in, power winches and so on. And immediately the fisheries declined. So the local areas produced fisheries committees and passed bylaws to reintroduce legislation. And Herdman's idea was let's have classes for fishermen teach them about the sea and the fishes and what happens if you overfish and so on and what the gear does underwater to prepare them for legislation that was coming in. They'd yeah. be more sympathetic towards it. Right. And these, these classes ran for about 14 years and I think five or six hundred fishermen attended them. They were paid to attend so that they weren't losing out on their fishing income and they were thought to be very successful. So when he came to the Isle of Man he already had fisheries in his mind mm. and he talked to government about this, and government were quite enthusiastic, because now Herman wanted bigger premises. And he persuaded the government to build what was the nucleus of this lab for a couple of thousand pounds. Mm. And it had a public aquarium, it had some laboratories for research, and indeed for bringing students over from Liverpool to teach, even from the very beginning. Right. And also an aquaculture facility. Because Herdman was convinced that whatever we did, we probably couldn't arrest the decline of the fish from fishing. And what you had to do was to grow them, especially past the very early vulnerable stages. And then you would put these in the sea and they would, the fishery would burgeon. Was, was that theory at this stage or had he done it practically? There had been some experiments in Norway and in the United States. And a lot of anecdotal stories came out that, you know, suggested the sea was, you could walk on the water with the number of fish that then survived. <laughs> um, so he, he decided this, this should be done. And this was the first place in the British Isles anyone had tried mm. this. And I think within very few years, they were producing something like five million baby plaice 
you know, tiny little really? larva. Yes, and something like 50,000 lobsters, which had been grown in the laboratory, yeah. and then were to be put out in the sea to try and increase the crop. That was a, a, an amazing achievement, really, I suppose, to the time, wasn't it? It was astonishing, yes. Now, this building then was, uh, mm. I, I presume they opened it, or else started building it in, in 1892. That's right, 1892, and it was, it moved to the present site in 1901. And Herdman himself then will have uh, sort of masterminded the, the early days here, will he? Oh yes, he was very much the kingpin and although he was stationed really in, in Liverpool, he would come over here for all the summers and so on. And, and he was quite independently wealthy and so was his wife. And so a lot of the equipment they had and, and so on, particularly boats for example, they used to have to use a boat that belonged to Liverpool Salvage Association uh, to begin with. But it was in fact a retired gunboat that had been used by General Gordon up the rivers during the Boxer Rebellion in China. And so it was totally unsuitable. It was, it was flat bottomed, so although it was quite a substantial boat, it wallowed you know, terribly, even when it was in harbour, and it could only go three knots, full speed. <laughs> so it could go full speed backwards in a current. But it was, of course, heavily armoured, and once when it was uh, a naturalist noticed it was going towards the rocks, he warned the captain, we're going for the rocks, and the captain just said, well, so much the worse for the rocks. <laughs> but the only boat they had here that was their own was a sort of thing called the shell bend, which you bought. It, was a, it resembled a hollowed-out wooden banana. And worse still, it was a folding hollowed-out wooden <laughs> banana. You could actually fold it up and put it on your arm and carry it away. And of course, it used to fold up at sea sometimes. So this would never do. So Herdman had to take desperate measures, and he married a shipping heiress. <laughs> and she bought in the most beautiful steam yachts, absolutely gorgeous steam <laughs> yachts, which he used for work. In fact, of course, a lot of gossip on the island, and he had to write an article in the, in the paper saying that, um, contrary to the rumour that I am using the university's research ships for my pleasure, these are my own private boats, which I am allowing the university to use for research. <laughs> So that was the start of the facility that we know today as the Port Erin Marine Laboratory. But why Port Erin in the first place? Is there something special about this part of the Irish Sea? Oh yes. This area is marvellous for the underwater fauna and flora because it's, it's kind of at the southern limits of those Arctic species that come south and the northern limits of those warm water species that come north. So we've got the best of both worlds. Right. And a place like the, the sound where, you know, between here and the calf, certainly the richest place in the Irish Sea for underwater life. At what point then did Liverpool University become involved uh, as they have become and, and importantly connected and, and, and operating really? Well, first about 1919, they kind of took it over from government. I think they paid government a guinea. And my understanding, I don't know if it's true, is they've actually, government have now paid them a pound to get it back. Well, they're, they're good to going to, I think. <laughs> is yeah. that right? So they've lost, lost a shilling on that deal. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, they, and the idea was that they would bring across students from oceanography and, and, and from zoology and so on, but they would also do their research here. Mm. And so for many, many decades, this was a sort of outpost of the university. Um, with a small bunch of, a bunch of scientists who were doing their own work here. And it was funded mostly from the British government sources, not directly from the university. Mm -hmm. Then, in the 1970s, it was very early 70s, it, was, it became the first place in the British Isles to offer a degree in marine biology. And it became a department of marine biology with its own professor. Mm. So, really then, this facility has been research, it's been education, and it's also been assisting particularly the Manx government. Now what, what sort of involvement has there been with the Manx government over the years? Oh, quite close. I mean, from the very beginning, the reason the Manx government were interested is because they, they wanted to encourage their fisheries. And there was a big uh, fisheries for uh, herring in that time. Mm. And so <sighs> any fishery has problems. And it's because it's a shared resource. You know, a farmer sows his fields and then waits for the crop to grow and then harvests it in the, or harvests it in the, it in the autumn. The trouble is in the sea, no one owns the field. And so everyone wants to grab the crop before someone else does and inevitably the, the crop declines. Mm. And fish and shellfish are the most intensively hunted animals on the planet. 
without a doubt. Well, I mean, it was the herring industry that sustained the Isle of Man to mm. a large extent for so, so many years, didn't it, really? It did. Trouble with herring, it was a very much a boom and bust. It, you had some years, I mean, going back in history now, but this was, this was quite the common pattern, some years when fishermen were literally uh, at starvation level, having to sell their gear to support their family, and the very next year there'd be so many herring that Cornish fishermen were up here fishing in our waters, and they, the, the price plummeted so much you could, they, they were almost worthless. Yeah. So it was a very strange fishery, and over time, with overfishing adding to this problem, the, the, the bust years became more common than the boom years. And um, herring <laughs> went out of popular favour as well, I suppose, didn't they? Astonishingly, yes. I, I cannot think of a fish that I, I enjoy more than herring. I'm not a great fish eater, but herring I absolutely love. I remember going to a dinner at uh, a posh club, gentleman's club in, in Sweden, and on the table all there was was herring. There's about 30 or 40 dishes, mm. every one of them different, and every one of them delicious. Now I understand that most of the herring goes to feed salmon, goes as fish meal. That's a, that's a tragedy. What role has the laboratory and the, the marine uh, uh, setup here had, in fact, with uh, conservation and, and stocking? I mean, let's talk about uh, the, the uh, farming of, uh, of uh, sea creatures then first. Well, first of all, they concentrated on flatfish because they were valuable and so mm. on. That was from Herdman's day. And Herdman didn't, it wasn't as successful as it sounds. He did manage to produce them in large numbers, but when they put them on the sea, there's a strange thing that happens in cultivating many fish. They, they have funny colouring in, when, in cultivation, whether it's to do with diet or the conditions, I don't think it's really known, mm. but they come out often blotchy. I mean, they're perfectly healthy, yeah. but they don't look as good. And when you put them in the sea, they're very much more conspicuous than the normal ones are. So you get increased predation, the predators spot them all, but when he put his uh, first batch yeah. of place out, thousands and thousands of them were eaten in the first week. Right. Um, but long after he was dead, uh, they were trying to cultivate pl uh, pl place in Britain. It was the sort of their Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, the White Fish Authority. Mm. Um, and they couldn't do it. They had a cultivation system and it just didn't work. They couldn't do it. And they remembered that Herbman had done it very successfully many years before. And they came here to Port Air and they built what we call the West Wing, which is really a huge shed. Um, and that was built specifically to study the, cultiva the early cultivation of place for commercial reasons. Mm. And they did it wonderfully. They even had tasting panels to see if you could distinguish a cultivated fish from um, one that was wild caught and so on. And all the problems of cultivating flatfish were cracked here at Port Air. And so that was a great success. What about cultivation of other species? Oh, um, they, uh, one time they were doing, they were doing oysters um, because the oysters were suddenly becoming a, a big crop. And in mm. fact, there's a nice little corollary to that. Uh, they had to feed these oysters. They were cultivating them here. And they said to one of the lady who was studying the seaweeds here, studying the algae, they said, we need some tiny algae to feed to our oysters. So she went out and she collected some from the bay and she tried to, and she tried to identify them and found she couldn't, most of them she couldn't identify at all. They weren't in the books. Mm. So she produced something for them to feed to their oysters, but what she did then was to start studying these things in their own right. And she later on became a fellow of the Royal Society and the world authority on these microscopic algae. Yeah. Her name was Mamie Park. A reminder that you're listening to Time to Remember on Manx Radio with Professor Trevor Norton, the director of the Port Air and Marine Laboratory. On the subject of conservation, Trevor believes that, along with fish stocks, there has to be consideration for the fishermen. There are two problems here. There's the conservation of the fish themselves, the stocks, so there's some fish in the sea for next year's catch. But there's also the conservation of fishermen. It's a social problem, and I think it's certainly true that the only really endangered species are fishermen. And so it's a social problem as well, and government have to balance these things. But we... Every year we send someone to the major meeting of fish scientists um, in Europe and they, they discuss the, the stocks of all the species and they make recommendations to the Council of Ministers and the Council of Ministers then, taking other factors into consideration, decide what the controls will be, what the, you know, what the, the catches will be, and they set the quotas. So we've always done that for many, many years. Scallops took over from the herring, didn't it, as the island's most important industry mm. in, in fisheries? There wasn't a sort of market. You know, there used to be 
thrown back, but then suddenly there was a market for them. I'm not surprised, they're delicious. Mm. And it suddenly became the major fishery on the island. So did you then get involved in uh, creating scallop beds and uh, queenies and so on? Well, no, what we, we got involved almost right at the beginning in collecting the information of how many scallops there might be and whether the numbers were declining. And certainly, of course, they have, and that's exactly what happened. Mm. Um, the, the scallops you see out there now are far less abundant than they used to be in the 50s when the fishery really got going, and certainly earlier than that. Is it a sort of feast and famine crop, crop like the heron was? Uh, no, they're much more they're, they're longer lived and they're more stable, but of course they're, they're fairly easy to catch. They're not going you know, to run away from you. The trouble is that there are, there are regulations. You, know, you cannot catch ones that are below a certain size and age. But once they get to that age, of course, they're immediately caught. Mm. Now, we've pioneered, not only have we got a lot of data on this, we've also managed to make mathematical models about it. And what we find is that we can now predict what the scallop crop will be in this area about three years in advance. Mm. And we can do it to about 80% accuracy. Right. So it's quite a useful tool. But what we're doing much beyond that now is we've got, thanks to the good offices of the government, we've got a closed area, about a square kilometre of the shore of the sea bottom, where you don't you don't fish. There's no fishing there. And that's given us two great advantages. One of them is it's allowed us to see what the, the sea bottom should look like, because we've no idea what its natural state is. We can only see it after decades of dredging. Mm. Um, and the other thing we can do, we can actually use it to allow scallops to grow to maturity, to grow you know, beyond the, the minimum size at which they would normally be caught. Mm -hmm. And what we found, we've got a lot of large scallops there now, and we found that the sort of reproductive output of this area is about 12 times greater than all the surrounding waters. That's very good news, isn't it? Well, it is, and it's better than that because it isn't confined to the area because the way that scallops reproduce, they produce these little tiny larvae which swim and drift away. So that what they're doing is they're seeding all the surrounding area. Mm. And it looks like the catches in that surrounding area are now going up and not getting much respite, of course, mm. because we don't know how much they would have would go up if we just gave them a little rest. Yeah. But it looks like the catches are going up as a result of that. And that's characteristic of what happens in conservation areas all over the world. And now what we've been doing is growing scallops past these delicate early stages, mm -hmm. or in fact bringing them in, and we've been planting something like 50,000 juvenile scallops were seeded into the closed area recently. And the idea is to see how long it takes them to grow on and so on in terms of some sort of management strategy for the future. Well, let's just move on then to one of the other sides of the work here. And that, of course, is the, the student side, the, uh, the training of future marine biologists. Um, now, is it a romantic job being a marine biologist? Well, I've noticed that uh, all the villains in James Bond films seem to have it as their hobby. <laughs> uh, so, so that's why quite a lot of students probably do it. Uh, I think one of the things I will miss when I retire is the teaching. It's something I've absolutely loved all through my career. And on average, we've, ha we've had over the years something like 160, 180 students who've been taught here on the Isle of Man in three courses. Um, and in addition to that, we teach, I teach a course in Liverpool which has over 350 students, so quite a big course. Yeah. So we teach a lot. Um, well, what is it about marine biology that attracts them to go in for that? I mean, they're not all going to become marine biologists, are they? No, they're not. I think, I think it's, it's a marvellous combination of science in the laboratory and science out on the shore. So, in so the you're field. not always in a classroom? Oh, no, 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 no by no means. The, the, the wonderful thing is you can give them a lecture about something in, in the morning and in the afternoon you can be out there on the beach studying it, you know, yes. and that's a wonderful combination. Now, you weren't here at the time, but this place was here, of course, during the two world wars. Was it able to do anything in those two periods, do we know? Yes, it, it was. It, it had a skeleton staff, as you can imagine, because most of, the, most of the male scientists were called up and quite a lot of the technicians and mm -hmm. so on. But they did a lot of work. Uh, fortunately, it was a tremendous time for the shores. When the marine biologists came back after the war, when they were demobbed, they said, oh, they couldn't get over how rich all the shores were. Yeah. It was because, of course, they hadn't been here plucking everything up with their <laughs> students. Because the worst thing that could happen for a shore is to have a marine laboratory nearby. Oh, right. A car park's pretty bad, because then people go down on that shore. Yeah. But a marine laboratory and a car park, that's, that's, that's desperate. <laughs> oh, but they did, they did a fair bit of work. And of course, during the war, they also had a much more, uh, much more of a social uh, role. 
because, as you know, the whole of Port Erin was an internment, woman's internment camp. And unlike the men who, who seemed to be very much more organised in their entertainment and they'd play in football leagues and so on, and, and the art was burgeoning, the women really weren't given anything to do. I mean, there are stories of women knitting their jumpers, unpicking them so they can knit the same jumper again. And, and boredom was a real problem. Yeah. And these were mostly educated women and, you know, they, they had nothing to do. And so the, the laboratory here became a social center. It got a new library, which was not marine biology books, things for them to read. Yeah. And it also used to put on lectures every week. There were several lectures, some of them given by the women themselves. And the women did research projects as well. You, you've kept records here over a long period of time, haven't you? Yeah, not just for the fisheries, which we have long, long records, but also on the, on the, on the state of the sea. Again, over 100 years ago, and this again was started by Herdman, we started reading temperature in the same places very frequently throughout the year and year after year. And people wonder what on earth we're wasting our time doing this for. And then, of course, when global warming reared its ugly head, they said, you've got what? What records have you got? And over the years, not only we have the records, and of course, we didn't just take temperature records. Over the years, we added to this. We would start looking at the nutrients in the sea because that's what it needs for the growth of the, of the plants. Over the year, we measured more and more. And we've been doing it now for over 100 years. And what you also get is if there's too much fertilizer in the water, too much nitrate and phosphate, whether naturally or coming from pollution, the, the plankton can go berserk. And it can really bloom, and that can be dangerous. It can kill fish, and it can, it can produce toxic blooms and so on. So we monitor these quite regularly. Recently, you had contaminated species notified publicly, haven't we? That's right. Presumably, there must have been contamination at various times anyway. These toxic blooms are getting more common, but they've always been around. Uh, uh, what causes those? Do we know? Well, they produce the toxin themselves. It's not, they don't pick it up. Mm. They actually cause a toxin. It's very, very powerful. I mean, sometimes it's, it's you know, five or six times more, more toxic than being bitten by a cobra. Uh, we're yeah. talking about very, very really? toxic things. If, and they, and they, they're often, these are things that are filtered by things like mussels or scallops, perhaps. And, of course, if you would eat one that was contaminated, that could be quite serious. But they, they, they need calm, warm conditions, usually and a bit of a bit of fertilizer a bit of nutrients in the water to make them grow because most of these things are microscopic cells and instead of reproducing in the normal way what they do is they split so you have one which splits and that's two then you've got four then you've got eight you've got 60 and you can do it every 20 minutes so you can soon get an incredibly dense soup with millions and millions of these cells in the water and at night they suck up the oxygen mm. so fish can suffocate if they swim through it and then of course there are these these toxic problems, right. but they've always been around. I mean, we've heard stories from fishermen and other people about strange-looking fish and so on in the Irish Sea as a result of uh, uh, Sellafield and, and, and that sort of thing. I mean, have you ever discovered any misshapen creatures or any um, s sort of strange fish uh, in this Irish Sea area? Oh, I think I think fish have got some abnormality. You know, we we should really be amazed that when an egg starts dividing and starts reorientating the cells, that you actually get a, a perfect creature almost every time. Yeah. You know, that that herring looks like a herring. That human baby looks exactly like a human baby yeah. should. It's very easy for slight mistakes to cause quite a substantial amount of abnormality. Some chemicals can make this much worse, we do know. I mean, remember the thalidomide scandal. Mm -hmm. um, but there have always been abnormal creatures in the sea, ones that have got an extra leg or they've got to, you know something oh, okay, an extra yeah, eye or something yeah, like yeah. that and victorians were fascinated by them they loved them <laughs> they you know they thought these these were great they have it museums full of them <laughs> i don't think there's any evidence that they're actually more common now than they ever were and the wonderful thing about the irish sea uh, thank goodness is that there's tremendous tidal currents going through it so the water doesn't stay here very long it rushes through and so it's always being flushed out, as it were. So are you saying then that water quality is just as good as it would have been, say, 100 years ago, and bearing in mind the sort of things we, we throw into the sea now? Traditionally, when we've disposed of sewage, we've, we've relied on it being dissolved in the water and dispersed. Mm. You know, it, it's diluted, so it gets less and less toxic, you know, less, less and less concentrated, yeah. Yeah. and then it's swept away. And we're very lucky on the island that because we have these strong currents, 
except in a little sheltered bay. Yeah. That happens very readily, mm. and it's being diluted on a large scale. And it happened with all the cellophane waste. Right. Um, although, of course, some of it got into the food chain. Nonetheless, a great deal of it would drift northwards out of the mm. Irish Sea, mm. and you could find these isotopes way, way around in the old days. They'd come around in Aberdeen or in, in Northumberland, because yeah. they go all... Or even have, further. And yeah. that's right. And because they were so distinctive, you could recognize them easily. You knew mm. this, 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 this isotope could only have come from Sellafield. Right. It, it was very bad in, you know, many years ago, but the, the, the amount that's being released now is really very, very minimal. So the water quality then isn't of concern at the present time? Is it? We're lucky. It's pretty good. It's much worse, for example, in, more, in, in, in the Liverpool Bay mm. because it tends to be a sort of side cul-de-sac there where the, there is water does drift out of it, but it's, it's retained there for quite a long while. Mm. And, of course, there's a big collimation there. There's the, all of Liverpool and, and, and other places that are putting their sewage into the sea. You mentioned it earlier, global warming, taking temperatures over 100 years or whatever. What evidence have we got from your figures of, of global warming changes, changes in, uh, in the sea levels or in the sea temperature? Well, we don't have anything on sea levels, but there's no doubt, I think there's no doubt now that there is, there's some change. What's causing it maybe is still in dispute. So uh, have we got a warmer sea, essentially? Then? Yes, it's like, it doesn't take much. The sea's a big big kettle to boil That's right. you know so it, it does change very very slowly so quite small changes are very significant but we've had fluctuations over the, over the years and it now looks as though there's, there's some rise happening it's that when you when things get warmer they expand and so the sea gets deeper mm. so we are seeing in some parts of the world definitely the effects of sea level rise and that's a serious problem for the Isle of Man because most of our towns have got at least part of them that are very close to high water it's not to the extent that the fish have to start adapting to warmer waters or, or, or change their, their sort of the lifestyle. What they do is they simply they'll move further north. If they want so to be colder, they'll right. go, yeah. That's right. They, they, if, they, if they have to have a, a cool temperature, they'll have to go further. Or warm species will be able to live further north than they did before. Right. And we've seen that in the past when they've been small. In the 50s, there were some changes in sea temperature in the North Atlantic. Remember all the cod wars we had? That was because the North Atlantic got significantly warmer and the breeding ground for cod moved up towards Iceland and Greenland um, and therefore there were these cod wars because we were after their cod <laughs> and it's all been reversed now. Well let's then come to this building itself and the future or non-future of it. It'll be up to 114 years when Liverpool University decide that they're, they're, they're leaving. How do you personally feel about that? I mean you must, you, you must be very sad about it. Very sad indeed, and particularly for, the, for my employees. You know, there are about sort of 25 employees here who will be made redundant or whose research contracts will terminate, and that'll be the end of that. Because mm -hmm. we'll definitely close now in the late summer of 2006. The underwater world of Professor Trevor Norton. In retirement, he plans to add to his many literary achievements. And on our next time to remember, we hear how a former member of the House of Keys spent his youthful days in the north of the island. <laughs>